Welcome to Copenhagen, where a quarter of Denmark's five million people live. In the background, you can hear the City Hall clock striking midday because I'm standing in Copenhagen's main pedestrianized shopping street, the Frederiksberkel, and guiding me through the halls of Christmas shoppers is our host, Mikael Berg, who presents the magazine for handicapped people on Danish National Radio and who invited us to come and see the various facilities that are provided here for disabled people. I think you could have done a bit better with the weather, though, Mika. Well, I, don't, I can't imagine it should be more worse than you had in England. Ah, but at least the snow has cleared up and it's freezing cold, I must say. <laughs> well, we're used to it. <laughs> but Denmark is very proud of the facilities that it provides for disabled people. Well, compared to English condition, I think we are doing very well at the moment. But, of course, we have struggles, and I think uh, the struggle should never end, because... <laughs> We're looking for, for this real inspiration for the same people, of course. Well, we decided to start here so that we could look at how accessible everything is in the city centre. And the first thing I noticed was that every single street corner, or so far every one that I've seen, has been rammed. Well, it's almost it's not everything is uh, street corner. But uh, in this uh, walking street area we are in now, I think that the access is quite good. Uh, of course, we have some problems with the old stores, the old shops, where we have problems struggles with the curbs. On the magazines, you'll find around here, the access is quite good. Magazine? Uh, I mean, ma major stores, of course. Yes. <laughs> and you'll also find toilet for disabled people in the magazines, all of them. You've got a car going past now. Does that mean somebody with a special disablement badge can stop in this street? Uh, no, not in this street. You can't do that. The lawyers you can hear right now, that's for, yeah, I think that's good. For, um, for one of the stores. But what about uh, the orange badge? Do you have a scheme like that? Yes, it's not as good as yours. I must admit that. Uh, there is a limit time when we can park. But on the other hand, it's a little more difficult to get the badges. Public transport then, is that accessible? No, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry to tell you, it's not. <laughs> so you do have your calls then? Oh yes, sure. Who's the major organization fighting for the cause of disabled people? Uh, we have a committee which is called the Committee for uh, Mobility, Living and AIDS. And uh, they have a leader called John Felix, and he's director. And in fact, I believe that it's a very good pressure group. Yes, we try to influence the way in which the buildings and streets and uh, everything is uh, constructed uh, so that it could be accessible for disabled persons. But how good is access into buildings, especially public buildings, for disabled people? New buildings, uh, they are uh, very good, but uh, in old buildings it is uh, not a part of the law that the old building should be fitted for disabled persons, but uh, we try to make some uh, campaigns and I think that uh, more and more buildings are, are going to be accessible. What about buildings for people to live in? Are they uh, built to a design which would accept wheelchairs? Eh? Uh, buildings are built after 78. Uh, are uh, with entrance and the uh, first floor flats are accessible for disabled and, and the rooms are arranged so that uh, there could be a uh, wheelchair user in, in them. Do you have legislation to prevent discrimination against disabled people? No, we think that the way to, to help the disabled people should be a part of the normal uh, legislation. Uh, we do not, as in, in England, have a minister for the disabled so that uh, the education system is the same for, for all people and it's uh, now normal that uh, disabled people should uh, go into schools with non-disabled. So if a disabled person thinks that he or she is being discriminated against, they can take the person to law in exactly the same way as an able-bodied person, perhaps a coloured person, who feels he's being discriminated against? Yes. What about the uh, amount of money which a disabled person receives? Is that very substantial? Yes, the most severely handicapped persons, the income is about uh, 70 to 80,000 Danish pounds. That's about five to six thousand pounds? Yes. And does that include mentally handicapped people as well? Will they receive pensions in the same way? Uh, just the same. So does that mean that you don't have large mental handicap institutions? Uh, we, we still have, but uh, at the time being, they try to get the uh, possibilities for the persons living in the institutions to come out and to be integrated in the normal society. And how prepared is the government to invest in adaptations to allow disabled people, whether mentally or physically, to live in their own homes in the community? Will they invest a lot of money? I think that Parliament carried good laws uh, through and, and then the, the local authorities are using the laws very well. But for example, Michael, how much 
did the government spend for you when you broke your back and wanted to live on in your house? I know that the cost was around 80,000 kroners, and what they did was that they built up two ramps to my house, one to my carport and one to the front door. And also they made a completely new uh, bathroom, the toilet. And, and uh, in my house I have a lift too, mm. but uh, I was supposed to pay that myself. But there must be still occasions when you do need to have some help for a disabled person, and yet they want to live in the community. How do you solve that without them going into some sort of residential home? Uh, our solution has uh, been the so-called uh, collective houses. In those houses, the handicapped can get help and live on an independent life. We have in total Denmark built uh, about 13 collective houses with 2,000 flats and um, it had been our goal that only one third of the tenants should be disabled persons and the other should be non-disabled. And the size of the house in Copenhagen? It's uh, with 170 flats. Well, looking out of your window, I can actually see the uh, collective house, but I'm not going to go there because Marlene Pease is over with us in Copenhagen, and with any luck, she should be on her way into the building now. Oh. Right, well, we've come out of the snow, past reception in the cafeteria. We're on our way up to the eighth floor, and we're going to meet Lillian Mulk. Lillian is one of the residents here. She lived here, in fact, for 17 years. She's a tetraplegic. Now, I wonder just what she thinks of these flats. To my mind, they look a bit austere. From the outside, it's all grey granite and very, very big. Anyway, we're at the eighth floor. Out we go onto a narrow corridor. Now, N1. Now, that must be it over there. Let's see. Hello, uh, Lillian. I'm Marlene. Hello. Hello, it's nice Hello. to meet you. Hello. My goodness, what a lovely flat you've got. Can I sit down here? Yes, sit down. Just what accommodation have you got? Yeah, I have uh, a bathroom, and a study room, and a bedroom, and a daily room, and a big kitchen. That's quite a lot, isn't it? And you, you pay for that out of your yeah. pension, do you? Yeah, I pay um, 2,200 pounds uh, a month. That's about £150 a month. But it's all purpose-built for your use. But really and truly, what's the best thing about living here from your point of view? That there is uh, a tenant system. Day and night, uh, there is nurse assistance on duty. And if I uh, call, we have a call system. They will come and help me. And only if I have called. Uh, and uh, that means that in spite of my... Um, severe handicap, I can li live independent. Who does the cleaning for you? I have a home help, but that's not special. If I were, uh, was living outside, that uh, would be the same. But if you're not feeling too good, there is a restaurant here where you can get a meal, isn't there? Yeah, but uh, not feeling too good. I do my own cooking, and if I'm lazy, I go uh, to the cafeteria to eat. How, in fact, do you spend your day? You don't stay here all day long, do you? No. I uh, go to school. I'm studying uh, to a social worker. Do many of the disabled people living here go out to work? I'm not really sure, but I think it's a little percent. No, only 50% of the flats here are occupied by disabled people. Mm -hmm. Do you think, from your point of view, that's a good idea? I think it is uh, very uh, important if you want integration of uh, handicapped people that you mix handicapped people and not handicapped people. Do you think that there should be more housing developments of this kind in Denmark? Yeah, because it's the only um, way you can live, in spite of a se severe handicap, you can live um, independent. You think you're better off here than living in a residential home, do you? I think I would uh, be uh, depressed because in this house I have my own economy and um, I have my own friends and um, if uh, you want to uh, have um, friends uh, overnight it is possible. I don't think I can have the same life in a residential home.
Right, well, thank you very much, Lillian. But just to see what the differences really are between living in an independent flat and a residential home, let's go back to John and Mikel, who, as it happens, are visiting a residential home just now. So now we've come to the northern suburbs of uh, Copenhagen. We're sitting in, well, it's, it's really like um, uh, the centre of a modern shopping arcade. But in fact, what is it actually? Mikhail? Well, this place is called Hamas High, and there is 78 residents here. It's a uh, home run by the state. In fact, I do know that the Lions uh, had donated a little money for it. Mm -hmm. But I think you should talk to Augustine Rasmussen. That's one of the residents, and he's sitting just beside you. Right, well, I may, may call you all. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, I don't think may. I could say any more. You may. Oh, this is, this is the center of the, the building. Yes, it and is. And you've got everything here. A yes. fish pond and, uh, and fountains in the back, aviary. And all around there yeah. are buildings, including a shop. Yes, yes. The other buildings are sort of workshops and places, aren't they? Yes, workshop and um, down here we have the dining room and uh, library mm. and uh, television room. You've even got a manicurist, haven't you? Oh yes, uh, and a pretty one. <laughs> so also a hairdresser. Yes. How severely disabled are people who are living here? The people who are living here are in the age from 18 to 45. Mm. And they are very uh, handicapped. They are not able to live even in uh, shilling houses. Yes. Yes. And sheltered homes. Sheltered homes. And is it important for you that you are this younger age group? It is very important. It's, there are more activity. There is uh, more uh, uh, people get talks more freely mm. and um, we get much more out of it. But each person has his or her own totally independent room? Yes, we have a whole room with own furniture and own accommodation, uh, bathroom and um, freeze and uh, so on. I've, I've been looking around and I'm absolutely overwhelmed with the, it seems to me, the luxury of the place. But you were saying that this really isn't anything outstanding compared with other homes around Denmark. No, it's, a, it's a, in my opinion, the same all over. Yes. And yes. you don't pay anything? It's no, state run. No, it's state run, the whole thing. The monthly allowance and the close allowance and so on are paid from by the state or the community. What about restrictions? There's no restrictions. What uh, about if a male resident and a female resident wanted to live together? Well, they are welcome to. They do they, so? They can do so, and some do, yes. You can do as you, wa as you wish in your room uh, under certain uh, condition. You can't uh, have a hula baloo all night and mm. so on, yes. but um, with uh, respect to the, your fellow people who are living here, you can have it. You can have it as you wish. But what about if you really did want to go and have a hullabaloo, say in, in the centre of Copenhagen? What about transport to go in? Twice a month, you can you can take a you you are free to have bus and taxi wherever you want to go in Copenhagen mm -hmm. to visit the cinema, theatre, or family. And uh, you also have uh, one each three months for a shopping tour. Closing spend your clothing around. To spend, yes, yes, yes. So you can maintain your contacts with the community quite well? Absolutely, yes, yes. yes. You've lived here for how long? Uh, three and a half years. And happily? Yes, I am. Mikhail, uh, we talked there about transportation. That's what we're going to find out about next. Yeah, we're going to talk to a guy called Holger Kellehaug. He knows a lot about the part of transport means. Uh, my role in this is that I'm chairman of the Danish Antipolar Society and talking about transportation in Denmark. I can state that the person you talk to at the residential home in a way is lucky because this residential home provides more transportation than most in Denmark. Are there no regulations then which give people a sort of basic uh, opportunity to get out and about? No, not when you live in a residential home. If you live in your own home or in a sheltered flat you have if you live in the metropolitan area a right to travel by a special bus four times a month what about uh, private cars do you get very much help in getting a car and adapting it we have reasonable rules on cars compared to other countries but the standard has been 
lowered three years ago. At the moment, you can have a new car every six years, and you get it without paying the taxes yourself, and you get a loan covering all of the costs, also for the adaptation, and you have only to pay back half of it, and you don't pay any interests. And what about public transport? Public transport in Denmark is not accessible uh, in the most respects. Buses are only two minor schemes working in local districts out of Copenhagen where you have bus systems which can take wheelchairs uh, and trains, the national railway system, have made only two trains up to now and they are only going uh, on one line from Copenhagen to the west coast at the moment. But we heard from John Fredrickson earlier that uh, if a person feels he is being discriminated against, he can take uh, the organization to court. Why aren't you taking the bus or the train companies to court? You can take them to court, but you will not win your case. Uh, really, you will have no case because we have no tradition for such discrimination cases in Denmark, not that you know it in England or the United States. But you see, I believe that this is very much a question of attitudes. And if you don't change people's attitudes, you have to take them to court every time to make something work. And that is not a good way to do things. I believe, and we do in the Danish Handicap Movement, very much believe in influencing people and politicians through the press uh, and through information. But does it work? Sometimes, not always. But I could mention that we in November 1980 made a small booklet on accessible toilets in Denmark. And it was a very cheap book and very small book because there were so few of these toilets. And the immediate result that we could make headlines stating in this area, there will be a hundred kilometers to the nearest accessible toilet. Uh, that was really a revelation, a shock for people and for politicians. So within three months, I think, the first 10 or 15 municipalities outside Copenhagen started building some accessible toilets. But you wouldn't want to deter those people who are at the moment trying to get anti-discrimination legislation in Britain. Certainly not. Uh, I think that you have another tradition in England, you have a tradition for using discrimination cases on the basis of constitution or bills, and I think if handicap movement can make that work in England, they just do, just do it. Well, I suppose rather appropriately after talking to Judge Kalahauga about uh, transport, we should be driving to our next interview, which is with yeah. you, Mika. That's uh, Henning Steff. Uh, Henning Steff is, is working for the government and uh, he's an expert in employment. And he knows a lot about how to integrate disabled people into work. So I think it would be a good idea to talk to him. The attitude is that disabled people should be employed in ordinary factories, they should go through the ordinary system uh, in order to get the tickets for the working force. And you find that that works? It works now. It's so that 85% uh, of the ordinary population of youngsters go through uh, an ordinary training system for the working force. And of course uh, the handicap does this as well. Uh, but what about their, their employment levels? I mean, do they actually get employed at the end of the day? They are getting employed um, with a little higher percentage than uh, their corresponding ordinary group. This is, of course, very broadly speaking. It differs from branch to branch and it differs from uh, category of handicap to category of handicap. But, but don't you need to use some sort of pressures at all to get the employers to take on handicapped uh, students? Basically, it relies on a fairly good, I'm not being too harsh about it, a fairly good understanding towards handicapped uh, people's rights. But you don't have a quota system? We don't have and we don't want to have a quota system because we think that a quota system will exclude more handicapped from the working force than it will include. What about financial incentives if an employer has to adapt to factory? The handicapped person can, from his uh, local uh, social security board, 
bring with him uh, money and equipment for adapting the working place at the factory. And this means that most employers will accept him as an ordinary worker. You said that uh, certain groups had more difficulty than other groups, though. Who are the ones who have most difficulty? Those people who are uh, mentally attacked, those who are slow learners and who are emotionally disturbed also. The problem is that many of those are not able to uh, understand the social communication within the different branches. You mean to, to fit in easily? To fit in, to get the branch identity and to communicate on the basis of that. But that's the exception. Why do you think you seem to be doing a whole lot better in Denmark than we're doing in Britain? I think that uh, Denmark is a very small country. We have only uh, five million people. Uh, we know the structures very well and you cannot get along with discriminating handicap without getting it known. And you don't like to come in the newspapers, you don't like to, uh, to be put out as a person who is not human. But there is also this factor that your education system uh, allows very severely disabled children to be educated in ordinary schools. We have opened up the educational system through the last uh, 20 years for every type and degree of handicap. It does not mean that we uh, do not have any special schools anymore, but if the parent wants the handicapped child to get the service in the local public school, the public school is obliged to give that service. Well, with a bit of luck, Marlene is in a public school now, finding out exactly what that service entails. I've come to a school to the north of Copenhagen, and I'm talking now in the staff room to its headmistress, Greda Mortensen. Greda, how are you able to integrate your children here? Well, let me first of all tell you that we have 31 disabled children in this school, which is a big school with 850 children in all. Uh, and this school has, from the very beginning, been planned as a school that could take handicapped children. 24 are placed in special classes and we try to integrate them as much as possible in the normal daily life of the school. And then we have seven disabled children who are totally integrated in our normal classes with extra help of course. For instance, individual teachers for some of the period according to um, the handicap of the child. Is this the only school of its kind in your municipality, or are there more of them? There are three more schools. The Ballarup municipality has been chosen as a municipality within the county where you can place the disabled children who need special care. How much individual attention are you prepared to give a disabled child? Some of our handicapped children in the older classes have um, out of 34 periods a week, uh, their individual teacher for 12 or 13 periods, where they can get extra help, where they can sit working with the teacher on their own, or the teacher can help the child in the classroom. Are all your teachers happy about integration? Well, that's a difficult question. I think all our teachers are positive and find it uh, a good development and the right one but not a development uh, without difficulties. Do you think that integration is necessarily the best thing for every type of handicap? I think that some of the most severely handicapped children will not always be happy if they sit alone as the only handicapped child in the class. I think our advantage is that we have our special classes with really severely handicapped children, some of them functioning at a very low level where you find it very difficult to teach them anything. Just to teach them the alphabet would be great. And uh, then we have other handicapped children who are functioning so well that they can take part in uh, the normal education in the classroom. But uh, the advantage we have at this school is that the handicapped children can find each other and in that way support each other and at the same time take part in the 
normal social life in their own class. And I think that's very good. Could I go into a classroom, do you think, and meet some of the children and see how it works for myself? Yes, I think that would be a good idea. We had Carsten in our 10th class and his smaller brother Torben in our 8th class. Both boys with muscular dystrophy. And I suggest that you start with Torben and some of his friends. Um, because Torben has been in that class from the very beginning since he was five or six years old and uh, they are now 14 and I think uh, all the children in that class regard Torben as just one of the friends who has always been there. Birgitta, how many children are there in your class? 21. And how many teachers do you have to look after 20 children? Two teachers, one who looks special after Torben. Now, is Torben doing the same work as you? Yes. Some of it, but not the, the whole thing. Does that affect you at all? No, don't think so. Do you play games with Torben? Do you uh, uh, invite him to join you? Yes. Torben is playing um, some kind of computer games very much, and he has got many of these games, and many pupils are interested in these games, so they play together. Torben. Do you like being in this class? Yes. Have you many friends? Are they good friends? Yes. Yo, you've grown up alongside handicapped children in school. Do you think it's a good idea that handicapped children should be in school with ordinary children? Yes, I uh, think it's very good because we learn how to be together with them and opposite. Uh, I also think it's very important that they have the same possibilities as us and at the w work they maybe will have, they can do the same as us and have the same education. And now I'm talking to Carson, Torben's big brother. What do you personally think of this school and the facilities that it provides? I think it's a good school. Apart from a, a teacher, you have someone called a practical supporter, don't you, to look after you? Yes. He helps me with to take up my book from my back and help me sometimes to read. Have you found it easy to make friends with the children here? Oh yes, very. What about after school, clubs, discotheques and things like that? Um, no, I don't want to do that. I, I'm sitting at my shelf and reading books and writing books. And do you visit any of the other boys' homes? I know your brother does. Oh, no, it's not. I haven't. But some of them have been on home at me sometimes. So they do invite you. Maybe you don't always accept. Oh, no, they don't invite me. But I don't care. Looking back, you've been at school alongside ordinary children. Yes. Do you think it's a good idea? Oh yes, I think it's very good to go in a normal class. They are kind to me. Well, to finish our visit here in Copenhagen, where I must say, Michel, we have enjoyed the most wonderful hospitality. Well, you're most welcome. You're thank you, thank you. <laughs> We've come to a concert, from the school hall to the concert hall, as you might say, to yeah. a concert courtesy of Danish Radio, and it gives me the opportunity to talk to you very briefly about leisure facilities and sports facilities for people in Denmark. Yeah. How good are they? Well, I must say that uh, we have problems um, to, to get our cinemas and our concert halls accessible, but I must say this concert hall is accessible. Uh, you mentioned the sports facilities. I've just been in Jutland, and uh, they there have a sports school uh, where they also now train seven people to be sports trainers, and those sports trainers, they will be uh, integrated in, in clubs for for uh, disabled people themselves, but also for, for able bodied people. So that's quite new and that's very interesting. So you would say that despite the recession, which is hitting Denmark, that like it's hit Europe and Britain, the momentum for improvements for disabled people, which have been so marked in this country, is still going on. Yes, it is still going on, and um, I think we will increase uh, this momentum. And long may it continue. <laughs> well, I don't think we can talk any longer because I think the conductor yes. is about to come yes. on. And we yes. shouldn't interrupt because this is going out live on Danish radio. That's we right. Can't. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Does He Take Sugar was presented by John Mills and produced by Marlene Pease. 
Now, attention all the complete passenger service for both disabled and able-bodied people. This is a, a converted bus that we were on certainly this morning. And uh, believe me, we, at times we thought we weren't going to get there because we had to satisfy, of course, the Department of Transport uh, that what we were doing in terms of conversion was going to be perfectly safe. And uh, to get over these hurdles, believe me, it took many months uh, of meetings to try to, to get out uh, the, the fine detail. They have to book the bus, I understand. Yes, uh, the, the, the booking facility at the moment is because of the limitation of the number of buses which we have available. But eventually, once we get more buses, uh, hopefully we'll be able to do away with that. Uh, we also, of course, have as a restriction at the moment that we must have an additional person on the bus in order to meet the Department of Transport requirements. And I hope that once uh, we have it in operation, that the Department will see that that uh, sort of requirement is not needed, because we usually have a friend, or we're travelling as a family unit, and uh, the family will aid us uh, in, in our travel. How do people get to the bus route? Because if you're disabled, that you need a wheelchair, you obviously can't just walk out of your front door and get onto a bus. No, uh, the, yeah, the bus which we're on today is a, is a double-decker bus. Now, obviously, a large double-decker bus can't get into some of the housing areas, uh, which we've got at the moment. So what we've also developed is a small micro bus. Now, this is a small bus, uh, which, again, is uh, fitted up for uh, disabled use or ordinary uh, use. And that goes and collects uh, the disabled people at their home and takes them uh, to the routes where they can meet up with the double-decker bus and then continue in the journey uh, into town to do the shopping. And this sort of mobility must have made a difference to the lives of some of the passengers here today. The first time I've been in years, I've been in a public service vehicle. And you like it? Yes. yes. Do you feel quite safe when you're wheelchair is uh, yeah, these, secure. These anchor points um, help to stabilise the chair and make it more safe going down corners. Your husband is uh, one of the wheelchair passengers we've just strapped in safely. Um, what sort of difference is this making to you, the fact well, that this bus? this bus was produced, we never got out together on a vehicle. Now we're able to go out together, go to the town, to the shops, things that we've never done before in our life. What do you use it for particularly? Shopping. Uh, my husband uh, went out to see the shops and couldn't believe the price of a pair of shoes because he hasn't been on a bus for so long. So he hasn't been able to shop? Oh no. I just come in and tell him what the prices are. He doesn't believe me. When he saw the prices he was amazed. What about the booking uh, system? Supply. How convenient do you find that? Well, you, you phone up a lady called Cathy on the dial a bus and make the arrangements. And how do, well does it work? Well, it works exceptionally well. It, it's good organisation. It's behind it all. Have you ever found any time when you wanted to use the bus and couldn't? Never, never. Well, I think everybody can use it. Uh, it's just that the facility is not available in every area at the moment. But in cooperation with ourselves, the Scottish Bus Group and British Rail, we are going to have, within a fairly short uh, span of time, uh, services covering the rural scene, rail and bus. And I hope eventually, and we hope in Strathclyde, to have this facility as standard facility on all forms of public transport in the future. Doreen Taylor reporting from Glasgow, and I dare say that those ramps will be working overtime a fortnight tonight. Why are you working that one out? Listen to this. Consumer group is a group of spastics that have an, uh, an opportunity to express their opinions and hopefully influence change within the society to express well, their opinions in a, in a, in a more formal way. Rather than have <coughs> on the committee itself, where we found that certain aspects of, that we discussed could cause embarrassment, which I think it, it can at times, we said, look, those of you that are interested, and there may be half a dozen who could do this, form a subcommittee, talk about the things you like, the things you don't like that we do for you, anything you feel that we ought to be doing that we're not doing, and each month put in either a written report or something, and we will discuss it. And it never got off the ground because they just they just lost interest. They preferred somebody else to think for them. I don't say it's a yes, good thing. Yes, but more careful of making them. I know. 
Well, that's an extract from a new film from the Spastic Society called A Shift of Emphasis. And that extract actually epitomizes why it was made, to show the need for the able body society to change their attitude towards their disabled members or receive a rude awakening. A Shift of Emphasis had its world premiere yesterday, but before it did, I talked about it to the retiring director of the Spastic Society, Tim Yeo. The purpose of this film was to take a critical uh, self-analysis, a, a look at the society, and in particular, a look at the conflict which exists right at the heart of a, of a charity like the Spastic Society, between the rather paternalistic uh, voluntary element, who in our case consists very largely of parents of spastic children, between them uh, and the thrusting, young, intelligent adult spastics who've now come forward and are uh, seeking a much greater say in their own future, in the decision-making in the organisation, a much greater responsiveness and sensitivity from the society about the needs of handicapped people. But to, to do this self-analysis, you had to literally look at yourselves. And uh, uh, were you surprised at the image which comes over? Was it what you expected, or was it perhaps worse or better than you expected? In many ways, it was what we expected. I mean, there were some very positive elements. The, the uh, management opportunities that are created in our work centres now, uh, perhaps overdue, but undoubtedly offering real opportunities for handicapped workers to get into management rather than uh, routine working positions. There were some shocks for us. One of our most cherished schemes at Milton Keynes, where we've got uh, a group of people living in the community in specially adapted houses, came in for some quite severe criticism and we obviously haven't yet struck the right balance for the for the severely handicapped adults who still want to get out in the community we haven't struck the right balance in terms of how much support they they need to have from an organization like ours and that was an eye-opener from our point of view needs change as life changes but we have the same rigid timetable day after day we don't even decide what time to get up or when we would like to eat okay. <laughs> But, uh, you want some of that through away, don't you? Yeah. Right. Life can't be genuinely independent because we're protected from the realities, often harsh ones. But realities make you grow up. These might seem trivial things, but when you're fighting for real independence as a disabled person, the fight is full of small battles. If I were really honest about Neath Hill, I think that's what I would call the scheme, a small victory. But how do you see the film being used now? Is it going to be used totally internally, or will it be going out into the, the general community of uh, groups of, and organisations for disabled people? It certainly will be used very widely within the society, but we want it to be used outside as well. We believe that the message of the film is one that applies to many other voluntary organisations. Many other groups have shown interest in this, uh, and I believe it will be used outside, both by organisations of disabled people who want to use it to make a point, and also by organisations for disabled people who perhaps need to conduct the same process of self-analysis that the Spastic Society has done in, in making this film. Thirty years on, the children who have grown up within the society are now mature adults seeking independence, seeking an outlet for their opinions. Opinions and perceptions that are often totally different from those of their parents. To practice a policy of achieving the maximum possible independence and personal fulfilment means more than just listening to them. It means involving them in decision-making at all levels. It means employing more disabled people within the society. It means, to put it boldly, sharing power. What's happening in Stockport, Nigel? What's happening in Stockport? And a shift of emphasis is now available on free loan from the Spastic Society, or it's on sale from two film companies. Details will be on this week's information sheet. And while its first public performance was going on in one theatre in London, there was an equally dramatic live performance in that other well-known twin auditorium theatre known as the Houses of Parliament. What you might call a two-act presentation from the Anti-Discrimination Roadshow was appearing in the Lords. I say two acts, I should of course say two bills. The first being Lord Longford's rerun of Bob Waring's Commons Bill, which founded there so spectacularly last month, and accompanied this time by a somewhat less powerful piece from Lord Campbell. Fidelity Simpson of Radar was there, and she told Marlene Pease how things went. They were discussed for four hours between the two of them, and at the end they were both given a second reading. Before them... Ah, both were given a second reading? Yes. I thought it was anticipated that Lord Longford's bill would have been thrown out of the window straight away. Well, I think that um, people voted on that because there's many people who feel that legislation is crucial, and recourse to the courts is crucial in anti-discrimination legislation. 
Fine. So if they've both got a second reading, is this good news? Does it mean they're going to go into committee and get a third reading? Well, no, it doesn't, because Lord Glen Arthur, speaking for the government, said that neither bills were acceptable to the government and they wouldn't give them any further sustenance in taking them any further. So even if they were given a committee stage, they wouldn't go into the Commons, but I don't think they'll even be given a committee stage in the Lords, as there seems little point, really. So where does this leave the sad story of discrimination legislation now, then? Well, I think that obviously discussion will continue both within and outside Parliament and there will be a great deal of discussion with government and opposition as to what sort of legislation would be acceptable and the government itself is, is saying that it's taking moves to help remove some of the um, difficulties that face disabled people. Marlene Pease talking to Fidelity Simpson. And from the characters at the centre of the anti-discrimination debate in Britain to one of the leading figures during that same debate in the United States. After helping it to a successful conclusion in the early 70s, Judy Human went on to assist with the running of the Californian Centre for Independent Living. Well, she was visiting London at just the time that Bob Waring's bill was being debated for the first time, and Philip Scott asked her what she felt we'd learned from the American anti-discrimination campaign. I think what, what you can gain from the United States is some of the or, um, uh, nerve that some of the disabled people in the United States have, where I, I think, you know, we've taken action into our own hands through civil disobedience on many occasions. What we need to take from the European countries is a more progressive social service system which has such things as national health insurance. Basically, you believe that disabled people ought to fight more for their rights. Yeah, I personally take the, the position that one should be willing to negotiate with your opposition, but that you have to set real stringent guidelines, timetables, around your negotiations because you can as you get into negotiating with people you tend to get to know them and in some cases they're not even always bad people um, and so you tend to uh, take into consideration their uh, need to extend timelines uh, the need for the fact that their bosses are dragging their feet etc and all of a sudden you're the one with the problems yes but how far can you take it i know that um, you were involved in various sit-ins on the high street and, and uh, there was one memorable occasion when you were um, holding up the Golden Gate. How far can you take it? Well, I think you can take it as far as your group is willing to take it. And I think that demonstrations where you have civil disobedience, where you're not injuring other people, is, is what I'm talking about. Sit-ins in buildings, stopping traffic, uh, those types of you know, picketing demonstrations where you're distributing literature and those types of things, I think, are very important. They also give disabled individuals a sense of power. And I think they also give you a sense of respect within the other communities who follow similar activities. I know that many people, though, would say that you would create more um, anger and uh, antagonism between the disabled and the rest of the community. And you would, in fact, damage the argument. How would you respond to that? Well, I would say that that's categorically not true if you've done your homework right. And I think in each case, First of all, there's never going to be everyone who's not going to agree or disagree. So you will always have some people who will say you've done something wrong. But by and large, the demonstrations that I've been involved with, we found that the support has been greater than the dissent. Judy Human, And just by chance, there was the latest move in what's been called a blatantly discriminatory case only yesterday when Tom Harley, the hostel warden who was sacked for allowing a romance between a disabled resident and her care assistant to continue, went before an industrial tribunal. Marlene Pease reports. Following an all-night vigil outside the tribunal headquarters in Woburn Place on Tom's behalf, the hearing began. But there was only time for Hertfordshire County Council to put their case on Friday, and the tribunal will reconvene to hear Tom's reasons why he thinks he's been unfairly dismissed in February. So more news then. Now, were you to ask anyone involved in improving benefits for disabled people which existing regulation they'd like to see changed first? I'll bet the majority would plump for the household duties test. Now, this is the sort of practical exam that married women who haven't paid sufficient stamps to qualify for invalidity benefit have to pass before they're given non-contributory invalidity pension. It doesn't apply to men or to single women, and as such, it's blatantly discriminatory. So you'd have thought that when the government in the new Health and Social Security Bill announced that it's to be abolished and replaced by a severe disability allowance, payable at the same rate, and with the same conditions for men and women, everyone would be delighted. But far from it. Indeed, the howls of outrage have been reverberating along the corridors of power. Linda Leonard of the Disability Alliance told me why. What the governments are doing is actually introducing a new form of discrimination between disabled people 
who are equally incapable of work. How will you do that? Well, for people who become incapable of work after the age of 20, they will not only have to show that they're incapable of work, but they will also have to show that they're 80% disabled or more. And what sort of test will show whether they're 80% disabled? Well, apparently the government's going to use the sort of test that at the moment's used in the industrial injuries and war pension schemes, which we think is totally inappropriate because those schemes are designed to compensate people for disablement resulting from, say, an industrial injury, whereas these non-contributory invalidity pensions are supposed to be income maintenance benefits. So the government's using quite an in inappropriate test. I mean, for example, how do you compare measuring the straightforward, perhaps, loss of a limb with disabilities suffered by somebody who's got high blood pressure or chronic arthritis? Or perhaps with a number of disabilities which cumulatively have a very disabling effect, but whose medical manifestations aren't perhaps so obvious as the loss of a limb. So, Disability Alliance's attitude overall? We are very shocked that the government has brought this measure in, and moreover that they've brought it in in such a rush before Christmas. Back in 82, Hugh Rossi, who was then Minister for the Disabled, announced in Parliament that when the results of the DHSS review of the household test, duties test was published, that consultation would then be invited. I mean, far from that, the announcement, well I, sh well, I shouldn't really say announcement, it was more of a whisper, was made in a written answer in Parliament a couple of weeks ago, and it's now being rushed through in the Health and Social Security Bill before Christmas, which is a really insulting way to treat disabled people. But can't you find it in your heart to welcome even one little bit of, of it, perhaps the fact that now there will be no discrimination between men and women? Obviously, yes, but as I say, we can't welcome a measure that's introducing another form of discrimination and is also leaving thousands of disabled people in grinding poverty. Linda Leonard, the campaign to abolish household duties test and other discriminating regulations is equally unhappy about the proposed allowance. Amanda Jordan, for the campaign, also concentrated on the numbers it would leave out. The government have acknowledged that 20,000 people will be brought into this new benefit, but they, by their own figures, they have acknowledged that if it had just been abolished, that 240,000 women would have been brought in. We want to know what's going to happen to the other 220,000. You're saying, in a sense, it's sort of backdoor discrimination? Well, yes. I mean, there is still discrimination there, but it will be discrimination against those people who have insufficient contribution records to be able to claim invalidity benefit. Most of those people will be married women. The campaign made it known that it was intending to bring a test case before the European Court concerning the discriminatory effect of the household duty test before. Presumably, if this bill goes through, you wouldn't be able to bring that test case down anymore. Well, we will still be looking at this, but of course, by abolishing the household duties test, they've made it very difficult. But we still have the other half of the campaign, which is invalid care allowance, which married women are still unable to claim will obviously p be pursuing that side of the campaign in the long term as well. What proposal would you be putting forward instead of the abolition and the introduction of the 80% uh, disability level? Many organisations are looking at the introduction of a comprehensive disability income for all disabled people, regardless of their sex, age or cause of disability. We want to pursue that road and we would like to see that there is no limit of 80% loss of faculty on any new test. What sort of level would you see? Well, this is a matter of debate, but it would have to be something of around the 20% mark. Amanda Jordan and Peter Large, acting as a spokesman for the Disability Income Group, is particularly incensed on two counts. Yes, the first count is that fewer disabled married women will benefit in future than would have benefited had they maintained the household duties test. The reason for this is that the 80% degree of disability is in many cases a fiercer test than the ordinary existing household duties test. How many women would lose out? The government in their report on the household duties test estimate about 16,000. That really is a guess and I'm worried that there's going to be a lot more. And in the second objection? The second objection is that it mixes up um, an assessment of disability which is basically used to assess a person's need for a cost allowance under the industrial injury scheme, the disablement benefit. It mixes up that with an incomes maintenance benefit. And there is no correlation between degree of disability and inability to work. You can be 10% disabled and unable to work because of your disabilities. 
You can also be 100 or 120 percent disabled and be able to work in spite of your disabilities. And to mix that up with an income's maintenance benefit is, in our opinion, absolute nonsense. But as somebody who has perhaps more experience than almost anybody else in fighting for disabled causes in Parliament, what hope do you have of any change being made in the bill at this stage? Very little indeed, frankly. I think they'll stick to this. One can perhaps force them to down a little from 80% to 50%, but in my opinion that's totally unsatisfactory because you've already complicated the system by adding in this second test for what should be a straightforward incapacity to work benefit, an incapacity brought on by disability, and that's what digs after, straightforward incapacity benefit. Peter Large, if you want to make sure that you're receiving everything that you are entitled to, the new disability handbook is just out, priced two pounds from the Disability Alliance at 25 Denmark Street, London. As for our information sheet, just send your stamped addressed envelope to Does He Take Sugar, Broadcasting House, London, or for matters outside the programme, you can phone on 01 927 4909, 927 4909, but during office hours, please. Next week, a Christmas special. So till then, goodbye. Does He Take Sugar was presented by John Mills and produced by Marlene Pease. In a moment, wildlife. But first, over to the newsroom and Peter Donaldson. BBC News. A car bomb exploded outside Harrods department store in the Knightsbridge area of central London early this afternoon. Scotland Yard say that nine people were killed. Within the past hour, they've said that of the nine, two were police officers. More than 70 people have been taken to hospital and three are said to be very seriously ill. The police say there was a warning about the bomb. More details from Graham McLaggan. The streets and the department store were packed with Christmas shoppers when the car bomb went off at about 20 past one. Witnesses talked to the vehicle in Hans Crescent exploding in a ball of fire with a pall of smoke then rising into the air. The blast shattered plate glass windows and many of the casualties were caused by flying glass.